Hi, today's talk's going to be about breathing. It'll be kind of like a breathing 101. There's been a lot more attention recently in the media about breathing, the importance of breathing for health, conditions like asthma, anxiety, snoring and apnea, gut conditions, etc. Also more attention being paid to breathing by athletes for performance, more people going to yoga, etc. And then people like the Iceman who do some pretty amazing things with their breathing. We're going to talk about how breathing works, what it's for, the mechanics of breathing and what can go wrong and the implications of what can go wrong. So basically the purpose of breathing is for gas exchange. So we breathe air into our lungs and hemoglobin, which is a transport molecule, will pick up oxygen in our lungs and it'll transport, th transport it through our bloodstream from our lungs to our heart and then from our heart out to our arterial blood, whereby that oxygen will be released by the hemoglobin and is, goes into the cells for energy production. One of the byproducts of energy production is carbon dioxide, which is then sent back to the lungs and we exhale the carbon dioxide. So basically I mentioned earlier that uh, oxygen is picked up in the lungs and is released in the cells by hemoglobin. Now it's the same hemoglobin molecule in the same bloodstream that picks it up or goes from high affinity in the lungs to low affinity in the cells. Something has to change between the lungs and the cells. And what changes is the pH in our bloodstream. So our bloodstream goes from a pH of 7.45 to slightly more acidic 7.35 in the cells. So there's a shift of 0.1 in pH. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's enough to to create a, a very, very significant difference. If that pH shift didn't occur, then we would pick up carbon dioxide in our lungs, but never release it. What allows the pH to shift is the apparent waste gas. Carbon dioxide is exhaled, but we, we shouldn't exhale all of it. A reservoir of about 6.5% ideally is to be kept in the lungs, which then permeates back into the bloodstream to create this pH shift. This reservoir in our lungs is called N-tidal carbon dioxide and is vital for energy production. In fact, we only use one quarter of the oxygen we inhale at sea level. So 21% oxygen in the air at sea level and we use 5% of that 21%. Basically, what's more important than the amount of oxygen is how we get that oxygen from our lungs into our cells for energy production, how we use it. And what determines that is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is only 0.03% in atmospheric air. It's used by the trees, like we use oxygen for energy production. And therefore, this end tidal carbon dioxide is vital because we, can, we can't really get it from the air. It is what we call the limiting factor in breathing. It's, it's absolutely fundamental for us to get oxygen into our cells for energy production. The process that I've just described, whereby oxygen goes from the, the air in the lungs that we breathe to the cells for energy production, is described or known as the Bohr effect. Christian Bohr was a Danish biochemist who won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for describing how oxygen gets into our cells for energy production. Now, if we breathe ideally the way we should or the way we're built to, or, or in medical terms, according to diagnostic norms, then everything works beautifully. However, that's not how it works, unfortunately. So if we were to, how it ideally would work is we breathe through our nose, using our diaphragm to drive breathing. We breathe eight to 10 breaths a minute. A certain amount of volume of air goes in and out. It's a gentle wave pattern. Exhale being slightly longer than inhale. Wonderful, the bore effect works beautifully and we create energy and we're happy. However, the world we live in is very, very different to the world we evolved in. And unfortunately, we understand now that we do not breathe the way we're built to breathe. Most people over breathe. So we breathe up to twice as often as we're built to ideally. So the average person breathes 25 to 30,000 times a day. And ideally we should be breathing somewhere between 12 to 14,000 times a day. Most of us use our chest and shoulders rather than our diaphragm to breathe or to drive breathing, meaning that we use the upper part of our lungs, but not necessarily 
the lower part of our lungs or all of our lungs. And um, we breathe a lot, to, a lot more volume than we should. So we often breathe with a combination of mouth and nose. So that upsets this delicate balance that occurs in the Bohr effect and means that the, the amount of carbon dioxide in our lungs at end of exhalation that we call end tidal carbon dioxide is actually reduced and therefore the pH shift in our bloodstream is reduced. The end result meaning that we don't get enough oxygen into our cells for energy production. What the body will do if it detects that you're not, if it, that your carbon dioxide levels are low, the body actually uses carbon dioxide to de de determine breathing rather than oxygen. So if it sees that your carbon dioxide levels in your bloodstream are low, what it will do is it'll, there are two mechanisms, mechanisms it uses to limit the loss of carbon dioxide and therefore make breathing more efficiency, which ultimately means you make more energy. One of those is it causes apnea type episodes. Now an apnea basically means without breath, and so a classic example of apnea is we're snoring away like crazy at night, often with mouth open. We're losing way too much carbon dioxide because when you breathe with your mouth, up to six times the volume of air can go in and out. And as a result, our blood levels of carbon dioxide get way too low, low because we wash out that reservoir in our lungs and our body reacts by stopping our breathing. So an apnea person will classically be snoring away, they stop breathing, dead silent, and then basically about 30 seconds, 40 seconds later, they'll gasp and that's the body recommencing breathing. The other thing that can occur is that we can have uh, uh, what the smooth muscles surrounding our breathing tubes, the alveoli in our lungs and our other breathing tubes, it can be constricted. So the brain will send a signal to the, to the smooth muscle to constrict. And what that does is it basically narrows the diameter of the airways and limits the loss of carbon dioxide. And we basically, in asthma, that's what you feel is this constriction and spasm in smooth muscles in your breathing tube. What unfortunately can occur is that's not necessarily always specific to your breathing tubes. And you can also get constriction and spasm in your gut, in your circulatory system, any other system in the body that has tubes, basically, your, your urinary system, certainly your digestive system. So you'll often see with people who are anxious. When they're anxious, they overbreathe or stressed, and then they often get gut type symptoms when they're anxious. So they are the, those are the implications. Either you stop breathing. An example of a daytime apnea might, you might be, you're concentrating, you forget to breathe, and eventually your body causes you to yawn or sigh as an adjustment breath, or it causes constriction and spasm in smooth muscle that can contribute to a number of conditions like asthma, like irritable bowel, like anxiety like um, poor peripheral circulation, headaches and migraines. Um, there are many, many more, fatigue, etc., etc.